In the past several weeks, we've ministered from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 on the Spirit's gifts. And in that chapter, Paul stresses the nature of gifts and the necessity of them all for the proper functioning of the church. He does so by using the analogy of a human body to liken it to the body of Christ. And the analogy shows us that every single ministry gift, indeed every single uh, person, every saint of God is vitally important to the body of Christ. In our morning text, we see it again. Paul is using the analogy of the body. And again, stressing that we all do not have the same function, but differing gifts. But before Paul gets to verse 3 through 8, dealing with the different gifts, before we get there, whenever that comes here in a week or two or whatever, he gives us these first two verses which are vital to our understanding of what needs to happen in order for us to be effective in the use of our gifts. You know, I could skip those first two verses, which would be not in, which would not it would be wrong because it's part of the text, it's part of the context. But I could do that and just stand up here today and basically do what I've kind of been doing, saying, you know, like, please do not neglect your gift. Uh, please use your gift of teaching, service, giving, mercy, helps, et cetera, et cetera. Or would you do whatever it is that God's called you to do? Or I could say, Jesus needs you. This church needs you. I need you. But there would be something very fundamental missing in the message. Something that is preliminary to the use of our gifts. Not only preliminary, but something absolutely essential. The Apostle Paul is saying this, before I say anything about serving, let me say something about worship. <laughs> That's the issue. That's the essential thing. You, you, you see, before we do, before we go, we need to come near God. Before we use our gifts, we need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Before we go to men, we need to come to God. Indeed, if you will do this, you can read on. You, if you do not, you, you, you will not neglect your gift. You will, nobody will have to beg and prod uh, and prime. No, no, no. You'll know your place and you'll find your place in the body of Christ if you will do the first thing and that's become a living sacrifice, which is the equivalent of worship. Come on, somebody. You see, ministry is always a byproduct of worship. You cannot exhort. And listen, folks, before we get too much further and you got this in your mind, we're going to deal with this. But worship is not because we get up here and clap our hands and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'm not talking about that. We'll get to that in a minute. You, you, you cannot exhort people to service in a vacuum. Before my service will be rendered, my life must be given. When one's life is truly given, don't have to worry about him wanting to serve. Such was the case with the noble Macedonians mentioned in 2 Corinthians who gave liberally out of their own deep poverty to help others who were poor. And they were, they were, they were an example of service to God. But Paul says something very important before they gave themselves gave to others it says in 2 Corinthians 5 or 8 5 but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God the first thing is first they gave themselves unto the Lord when you give yourself to the Lord it's not hard to serve all spiritual service to others is a byproduct of our giving of ourselves first to God. This is a principle we must understand if we're to be what God wants us to be. And if you want to know your gift, you want to know your place, you want to know God's will, just give yourself first to God and you'll figure it out. Amen? Come on now, this is a great truth to understand. Paul is saying... Service must be done. Gifts must be fully functioning in the body. Every member must make their contribution through the gift that God has given them. But before we get there, we must give ourselves to God. 
Before service comes worship. And before you go out to do ministry, you must come to the Lord. Let me read Romans 12, 1 again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I want to look at the first part of verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Paul is urging. He, the word means to beg even. Begging them to identify uh, those, well, the, the, the Christians there, the believers. He calls them brethren, which that means saved folks like you and me. And, and, he, and he's saying on this premise, I'm going to beg you. By the mercies of God. <laughs> this is the premise. I'm urging you, he says, therefore, on the basis of the mercies of God. Notice the therefore. We always say around here, whenever we see a therefore, we always ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? So we have to ask, why is the therefore, therefore? Because it takes us back. To the first 11 chapters of, of Romans, all that's been said, all uh, which Paul is referring to as the mercies of God. The mercies of God describe all the great redemptive realities and blessings, the great salvation that we have. Now, let me just show you, read, read to you a few of these great redemptive realities, these blessings that we have received, what Paul calls the mercies of God. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it, we find in Christ we have been justified by faith. Again in verse 1, we have peace with our God. In verse 19, we have been made righteous. What a blessing that is. In chapter 6, verse 4, we are dead to sin and we've been raised into the newness, to walk in the newness of life. In chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In chapter 8, verse 17, we are the sons and the daughters of God. We are heirs of God and join heirs with Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, verse 18, we have a glorious future of hope. And we find in verse 28, God works everything to good to those who love God, called according to his purpose. We find in verse 29, we are his elect. In verse 33, there have been no charges laid against us. In verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In verse 38, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then chapter 11, verse 11, we've been grafted into the tree of Israel, and we are now part of the people of God. Wow, that's the mercies, that's the blessings of God. So he's saying to them and to us, up to this point, I've been telling you about the great mercies of God, the great blessings, this great salvation we have. Been telling you about what Jesus has given us. Been talking about the blessings of the cross. Now in light of what he's done for us, and now that we have been justified and we've been made righteous, that we have peace with God, that we're, there's no condemnation, that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, let's go on to the next step in the spiritual journey. See, we all like the first step because the first step is I get saved and I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. We like that step, but then Paul says, now that you've, you've experienced that, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to give God your body. Let me read it again. Romans 12, verse 1, the vast part. That ye present, here's what he's saying. Based on the mercies of God, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The first step is to give him your soul. And now Paul says, now, give him your body. <laughs> and he says this, it's reasonable for him to ask. In light of what he has done for you, <laughs> you think it's not reasonable? Indeed. Indeed. David said in, in Psalms 116, verse 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Oh, indeed, Jesus did. Mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. Verse 12, What shall I render unto the Lord for all this benefits toward me? And Paul will answer uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 12. He'll answer the sweet singer of Israel. He says, Present your body as a living sacrifice. 
I, not only that, it's your reasonable service to do so. Or we can say, this reasonable service is looked at by God as worship. To present yourself to God, that's worship. Hear me now. To present yourself to God. Present means to surrender or place at the disposal of someone. And in this case, it's God. That's not easy to do, is it? I mean, we like to play. I'm saved on my way to heaven. We like it. But now he's saying, present. Surrender. Me? Talking to me? Yeah, all of us. You're a believer? He's talking to you. Yeah. Be at the disposal of someone and God, yeah. In the Greek, don't let this mess with you. It's an aorist act of infinity. just simply means it's a once and for all act. Once for all, we are to present ourselves to God. It's a temple term, tabernacle, temple term. It means to bring something to God. And what is it that we're to bring to God? We're to bring our body. God wants you. You seen the Uncle Sam signs? Well, just imagine God in the picture instead of Uncle Sam. God wants you. And you and you and you and you and me. He wants us all. God doesn't want bulls and goats. No. He doesn't want dead animal sacrifices. He wants you. He wants you to be a living sacrifice. He wants your body, your abilities, your mind, your hands, your feet, your, your mouth, your ears, your eyes. He wants you. He wants to use you in his kingdom. Can you say amen? That's, amen. Go ahead and give the Lord. That's what he wants. Not, not what we want necessarily. I'll say it this way. It's not what our flesh wants. <laughs> we can say that, right? It's no easy task. It's no easy work to give up your body, the members of your physical body, your mind, your desires, your will, your tongue. It isn't easy. But in light of what he's done for us, it is reasonable. And not easy, but it's reasonable. And, and notice it's a living sacrifice called for, not a dead one. You can't do service for him, for, for him if you're dead. That's not what he's talking about. Let me, let me give you an example showing you the difference between a living sacrifice and a dead one. If we go back to Genesis chapter 22, to the story of Abraham and Isaac, we, we can see an example. God told Abraham, I want you to go to the mountain and offer your son, that one you've been waiting for 25 years for, that promised son, I, I, I want you to give him as a sacrifice. Wow, <laughs> you know how hard that would have been. Isaac was to be put up on the altar and killed, and in doing so, he would have been a dead sacrifice. Now, we know that didn't happen, but had it happened, God, you know, he, he provided Jehovah Jireh. But, but had it happened, we know that Isaac would have been a dead sacrifice. And had Abraham killed his son, Abraham would have become a living sacrifice. You say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, Abraham would have continued to live, but he would have just slain his hopes, his dreams, his plans, his love, his future. And yet he was willing to do it. Abraham was willing to make a living sacrifice. All of his own ambitions, all of his own hopes, all of his own dreams, his own plans, everything he hoped for, longed for, and loved and desired, he was willing to execute on the altar if God told him to do it. That's a living sacrifice. When God says, I want you to present yourself a living sacrifice, he's, he's not saying, I want you to die for me. He's saying, I want you to live for me. But did you catch it? It's for me. So, yes, you die to self and live for him. You don't live for yourself. And before we can be used by God, in gifts or ministry. Paul's saying you must die to self. Your plans, your desires, and present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. That's how it's supposed to work. I told you it's going to be challenging. I tried to warn you. But it's not me challenging you. It's God's word 
It's God's word. I think this is the reason why we have the statistics we have. We don't want to be this. <laughs> you know, 20% of the people do 100% of the work hmm, because it's not easy. 20% of the people give the faithful or the ones faithful to give. It's not easy. But my question to you, and this is the challenge for you today, are you part of the 20% or the 80%? Whew, that's tough, isn't it? Which part are you in that statistic? Oh, boy, should we pray now? I feel like maybe I need to pray right now. Come on. Let it speak. Let the Word of God speak. Let's not fight it. It's God's Word. Don't fight it. God, help me here. Help me. Sacrifice. What does it mean? It means you give something up you value for a higher cause. Uh, for example, you, you would look at baseball. It's within the game of baseball. They have what they call a sacrifice bun. It occurs when, you know, for example, there's a runner on first base with less than two outs, and it, it is beneficial for the team as a whole to get the runner on first to second so that he can be in scoring position, the idea being the guy next up. You know, gets a base hit, and he scores. The batter sacrifices himself by bunting, which usually results in an out in order to get the runner on first closer to home by going to second. The Cincinnati Reds need to learn how to do that a little better. <laughs> he sacrifices himself for the good of the team. Some players don't like to sacrifice, but <laughs> they don't. They, they want to hit a home run. They want to be the hero. But a sacrifice means you give yourself up for the good of the team. Those in the military uh, sacrifice their lives for our freedom. Those who do not lose their lives sacrifice by being away from their families for months. The very reason we are able to sit here this morning and freely worship is because of those sacrifices. Hundreds of tens of thousands have given their lives. The greatest sacrifice of all was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who came from the glories of heaven to the sin-cursed earth that we live in, stripped himself of his garments of glory and beauty, hung on a cross and shed his blood that you and I could be saved uh, from eternity in hell and have heaven as our home. He who was rich became poor that we who are poor might become rich. That's the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. That's the ultimate one. But let me tell you about some other sacrifices. Some, how about our Lord's disciples? They've left us in heritage. They have, and they're an example. They, Matthew suffered martyrdom by the sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city into the fire and burned. Luke was hanged on an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a, in a cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death and was banished to the island of Patmos. Peter was crucified on a cross upside down. James was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the less was thrown from a pinnacle of the temple and beaten to death below. Philip was crucified and stoned to death in Phrygia. Bartholomew was flayed alive and then beheaded. Andrew was bound to a cross from where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through with a dart and in Kalamina, India. Jude was shot to death by arrows. Matthias was first stoned, then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death at Salonica. Paul was beheaded in Rome by Nero. And you and I sit here today in our comfort, in our ease. And we think that maybe we made a sacrifice by just coming to church today and maybe putting a little bit of money in the bag, right? Uh, I don't think I have to tell you. I don't have to tell you guys are reasonable and smart people. There's something wrong with that attitude. If you indeed have that attitude, hopefully we don't. But the truth is, coming to church and serving Jesus in the first place should be our greatest privilege and our greatest joy. Amen. It ought to be a joy to come to the house. And if it's not, something's not quite right. You got to get it right because it should be. It should be. God is asking you to be a living sacrifice. He wants you to give up something for the good of the kingdom. 
these disciples and gave their lives for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They went to other parts of the world, sacrificed their lives. They paved the way for you and I to receive the gospel. And their blood and their sacrifice cries out to us today. What are you doing for our Savior? You don't think they wouldn't call you to account? What are you doing for our Savior? Paul says, I beseech you, my brethren, present yourself. Oh, this is not easy. Present yourself, all you, you that are saved, born again believers. <laughs> On your way to heaven, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. A church member posed a question to to a pastor, he said, will you please tell me in a word what your idea of consecration is? And so the pastor held out a blank sheet of paper and replied, it is, consecration is, to sign the bottom of this blank sheet and let God fill it in as he will. <laughs> That's a living sacrifice. Quite a commitment, right? Commitment? Now you're going to talk about commitment, right? The truth is, some get involved, but really few are committed. Lou Holtz, the former Hall of Fame coach of Notre Dame and ESPN analyst, was asked, what's the difference between involvement and commitment? And he said, involvement is the kamikaze pilot who comes back home. Hmm. Think of that. The chicken said to the pig, let's have breakfast. I'll provide the eggs. You provide the bacon. The chicken was involved, but he wanted that pig to be committed. And is it not true that's how we are? Uh, let me just use the pastor for an example, okay? You know, we, you would not put up for one minute an uncommitted pastor. No. You de demand it. But it's okay for you to be involved. But I, after all, <laughs> we pay you, pastor. You give us 100%. Come on now, I appreciate the pay. But that's now how God said the body is to function. God didn't say, well, you pastors present yourselves as a living sacrifice and then the rest of y'all do what you want to. Well, no, he didn't, did he? Whew. God didn't say pastor has to be 100% committed, the rest of us 50%. What if... Just think of this. What would you think at a wedding ceremony, the, the man is asked, you, you promise to love and to cherish your wife, forsake all others in sickness and health, richer for poor, till death do you part? And the man said, well, I'll be 80% committed. <laughs> She'd say, oh, no, you didn't. That won't work. She'd slap him until he couldn't see straight and walk away from that 80% commitment. Amen. But yet we think it's okay when it comes to God, right? All right, I'll move on. I read of his Russian czar, Ivan the Great, in the 15th century. He was a great conqueror, a great warrior. He conquered great amounts of territory. His men were getting concerned because, well, he had conquered all this territory, but he didn't have a wife or children as heirs to the throne. So they told him, man, you, you got a king, you got... You got to get married. And Ivan said, I just want to conquer. But go find me a wife. So he went down to Greece, and the king of Greece was willing to give his daughter in marriage. Of course, the reason he was, because he didn't want Ivan to conquer his land. But there was one catch. Ivan the Great would have to become Greek Orthodox. So they sent a tutor up to, to, to tutor Ivan in the religion, the Greek Orthodox religion, but Ivan didn't want to be the only uh, Greek Orthodox. He wanted all the men around him to be, bab uh, uh, you know, to become part of that religion. And so uh, he wanted them to be tutored as well. So they went to Greece. They've been tutored. They, they go to Greece and uh, to be baptized in the Mediterranean Sea, be baptized into the Greek Orthodox religion. There were 500 men. There were 500 priests and they were getting ready to, to, uh, to uh, you know, baptize these men into that religion. It was quite the scene. 
There were thousands there to watch, but before they were baptized, the king of Greece realized something. He said, man, he realized that in the Greek Orthodox religion, one could not be a warrior and be Greek, Greek Orthodox at the same time. So here there are 500 men with their armament on, with their swords. So there was this big discussion that ensued. And to, they were trying to figure out how they could resolve this crisis. So they came up with a solution. They decided that the Russian warriors would stick their swords in the air with their right arm out, uh, out, of, the, out of the water. And that's how they justified it. They, they, history looks back on it and, and calls it the unbaptized arm. That. They baptized everything but that arm with their swords in it. It's interesting, isn't it? Some of you know where I'm going, but do you know that we have a lot of unbaptized areas in our own lives? Huh? Unbaptized arms, unbaptized eyes, unbaptized desires, unbaptized wallets, unbaptized checkbooks, unbaptized relationships unbaptized time, tongues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why? <clears throat> I'll just be honest with you. Why? Because we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it, and we don't want anybody messing with what we want to do. We like our pleasure. And so don't mess with me, pastor. My reply to you is I'm not messing with you. God is messing with you. He gets in our business. You ever noticed? He's nosy. And he gets right smack dab in your business. And sometimes he uses me to do that. And you get mad at me, but I'm just the messenger boy. God is saying, in light of what I have done for you, on the basis of my mercy, I want you. Romans 12, 1, let me read again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let me read it from the Amplified again, the last part, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. We know there are other translations use that terminology, which is the essence of the meaning here. If you look at the word service, it means a menstruation of God. It means worship. It means worship. The word was used in the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament Greek text, to speak of worship of God according to the Levitical law. This is priestly kind of language. This is the language of sacrifice that Paul is using. The priest came to worship, and here it's still considered worship. When you come to God offering up yourself, it is worship. And before you can be used of God in the gifts or service, you must offer yourself to God. That is true worship. And let me just add this. Most people view music and worship as synonymous, and that's just not true. Some think that if you don't have a certain style of music, it hinders worship. Not true. Some think it has to be a certain style before we can worship again. Not true. True, music does not produce worship. Music is an expression of my worship. Because I have given myself to God, the words express my worship of God. If I haven't given myself to God, music may make me feel emotion. It may please my flesh. It may make me feel good. It may make me want to tap my feet feet, foot, or to clap my hands. It may make me want to yell out with emotion, but if I haven't given myself to God, it is not worship. Hear me now. You're listening to music that's called Christian, and it does not give you the ability to express your worship to God. To God, it's not godly music, no matter the label. It should be the determining factor of that which is of God and that which is not of God. Don't, does it allow me to express my giving of myself to God? Now, don't misunderstand. I love music. 
I love certain styles of music. I don't need music to worship. And if you need music to worship, mm, you probably haven't worshiped yet. Music is not the origin of worship, or we could say it's not the beginning of worship. It, it, it could be the end of it. Music is the expression of my worship. That's something we need to learn in the church. It's something we need to learn desperately in the church. What is worship? Well, we went and we loved it. It was so good. We clapped our hands. We raised our hands. We jumped. We shouted. Listen, sometimes I do that. Most of the time I do that. But it's not because of the beat of the music. It's because the words that are being said expresses my heart toward God. When you sing about the blood, I can lift my hands real quick. When you sing about what he brought me out of, I can lift my hands because that's expressing what's in my heart. You understand what I'm saying? I get emotional about that. Talk about the blood, and I get emotional. Talk about Jesus, and I, I get emotional. Amen? So it's not wrong to be emotional. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to be emotional without it being an expression of your heart, what God's done in your life, then it's not worship. It's entertainment. So before we can be used of God, we must give ourselves to him. We must become a living sacrifice. We must worship before we serve. Lauren Sani of the Navigators wrote some very practical thoughts on this verse. He said, God's best has been given to you. Is your best his? Your best begins with committing yourself totally to him. Then God will have your feet to take you where he wants you to go. He'll have your ears to listen to those who need listening to. He'll have your mouth to speak what he wants spoken. He'll also have your time, your career, your money. Have you ever said a once for all yes to the Lord? Like the yes one says in a marriage ceremony? Not only that, but as a living sacrifice, are you following the big yes with lots of small ones? I'm convinced this continual surrender is the key to being used by God. That's what it means to take up your cross daily. A once-for-all commitment to follow Jesus Christ as his disciple, followed by a lot of little commitments and adjustments and surrenders along the way. In giving yourself, you're turning over to God the most valuable thing you can give. As they come, Christian, believer, does the Lord have your body? It is scriptural. Paul says it. He says, I beg of you that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It he even says it's, it's reasonable. It's your reasonable service, your reasonable worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 summarizes the message beautifully. It says, for ye are bought with a price. <laughs> yes, indeed. What a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So I ask you, have you ever, by a very definite act of the will, presented yourself to God for his control, his use, and his glory? Have you ever done that? Oh, I know you're saved. I know you're born again. But have you presented yourself as a living sacrifice? I remember when I first, when I was first saved, and this will sound silly, and I kind of get embarrassed to say it. But as I hungered for God, not just the fact that I was saved, thank God I was saved, but I wanted to live for Him. I wanted to please Him and in my own simple, maybe laughable way. I would pray this, and I prayed it often as a new convert. I said, God, I wish I could just be a robot so that you could push the buttons and I would do exactly what you want me to do. 
Now, God saw, God doesn't do that, of course not. But God saw my heart. And what I was saying is, Lord, I didn't know how to say it then. But what I was saying, Lord, is I present my body as a living sacrifice to you. And I can tell you, had I not had that heart, had I not prayed that kind of prayer, I wouldn't be here today standing behind this pulpit preaching this message and I would not be effective in doing so had I done it. I don't have the charisma. I don't have the ability. I don't have the looks. I don't have the smarts to be able to do what I'm doing. But because I made that definite act of that prayer, a prayer, a definite act of my will to say, God, here I am. Not much. But I want to do what you want me to do. I want to live for you. I want to please you. I want my life to be that. Now, I will have to say, as Lauren Sandy said, that commitment was followed by a lot of little commitments and recommitments. And I haven't always been everything I ought to be, but I always come back to that. Always come back to it. Always do. It's why I'm here. And if you'll do anything for God, anything of any significance, it'll be because you've done the same.